It is the early 1970s and Lebanon and its capital Beirut are wealthy, thriving Muslims, Christians, living mostly peacefully side by side. But resentment is building as the majority Muslim population is being ruled by a Christian-dominated government. Amid minor clashes, gunmen fire on a church, killing four. And just hours later, right-wing Christians blow up a bus, killing 27 mostly Palestinians. That day will long be remembered as the start of tit-for-tat retaliations, which led to all-out civil war. We don't want war anymore. We've had enough of the war and sectarianism. We don't want any more victims. April the 13th is known for being one of the worst days in Lebanon's history. In 1976, with most state buildings in ruins, Syrian troops intervene. Beirut is divided into a Muslim and a Christian half. In no man's land in between, grass and plants springing up, the so-called Green Line. In the following years, there are numerous battles, often not even pitting Christians against Muslims, as armies and small militias fight together only to betray each other soon afterwards. In 1982, Israel invades to try to drive out the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Thousands are killed by right-wing Israeli-allied Christian militia in the Sabra and Shatia camps. Westerners are sucked into the conflict. Nearly 300 US and French peacekeepers killed by suicide bomb attacks in 1983. And Muslim militias take a series of Western hostages. After 15 years of conflict, which killed 120,000, a fragile peace deal is signed in 1989. Nowadays, that peace again threatened by fears the Syrian conflict will spill further into Lebanon. Our correspondents Salim El Medeb and Lucy Fielder revisit Beirut. The Ring, an urban highway that links what were known as East and West Beirut during the civil war. Today, there's always a steady stream of traffic along the former front line. 25 years after peace returned, Beirut has had a makeover. Millionaires' yachts are moored in the marina, and downtown has been entirely rebuilt. Hello. Luxury boutiques and brand new souks were designed to attract an international clientele that has been frightened away by the war in neighboring Syria. The scars of Lebanon's conflict are disappearing beneath the forest of towers that has invaded the horizon. But the concrete skeletons of some iconic buildings still haunt the skyline. The most famous of these is the Holiday Inn, once the height of glamour. It's nearly 40 years since Assad Shaftari last set foot here. The hotel had been open two years when war broke out and the revolving restaurant stopped spinning for good. Assad wasn't there to enjoy the luxury. He had a gun in his hand. This was one of the grandest and most famous places in Lebanon. What a shame so many died, whether from our side or the other, for this lump of concrete. Towering over the city, a perfect airy for snipers, the Holiday Inn became a strategic prize in the Battle of the Hotels, which began in 75. Assad had joined a Christian militia, the Falange, which was holding out against the Arab nationalist Marabitoun. The Marabitoun won. This propaganda film celebrates their victory. The first years of war laid waste to Beirut's centre. Assad was just a foot soldier at the Holiday Inn, but by the mid-1980s, he was the deputy intelligence chief for the Lebanese forces militia. We sent people on missions to kill, to assassinate, to kidnap, to interrogate. I did everything war obliges you to do. In the year 2000, after a decade of soul-searching, Assad published an apology. He remains the only high-ranking ex-militiaman to have done so. Here's the letter I wrote to apologize, and in it I also forgave those who harmed me. You can't do everything. You can't bring someone back from the dead, but you can try to stop someone else from killing. We've come to this school in Hadath, in Beirut's southern suburbs, for a history lesson. Today's subject is the outbreak of the First World War. But these 14-year-olds have never studied Lebanon's own conflict. No, I don't know how the Lebanese civil war started. I don't know much about it. Is it something to do with sectarianism? 
Their teacher recognises that knowing their past would help equip the pupils to build a better future. The problem is that the Ministry of Education decrees that history since independence in 1943 stay off the curriculum. We don't teach that subject because we fear it could cause sectarian provocation and problems between students. The civil war feels too recent for us. Maybe in 50 years' time, students will be able to discuss it. But Assad feels that's too long to wait. It's vital to act now. This evening, he and two other former fighters have met these young Lebanese to discuss the futility of violence. For the first time I dared to look in the mirror. I saw only ugliness. I saw all the things I was doing and all the things I wasn't doing. Most households here own at least one gun and sectarian tensions are mounting by the day. Assad fears that Lebanon could be on the verge of another civil war. The danger is that our generation didn't pass on what we learned to the next one. Young people could still turn suddenly and get overexcited and follow their instincts. So it's not surprising that some want bygones to be bygones. It's Saturday night at Sporting Club and Yasmin Sarut, a.k.a. DJ Ladybug, is warming up the crowd. For all its problems, Beirut is the undisputed party capital of the Arab world. It's no coincidence, Yasmin says. Young Beirutis are sick of being shackled to their city's war-torn image. Most people my age want to do something else, to forget themselves and move on in life, and do something that has nothing to do with the war. Yasmin balances DJing with a day job as a video editor, but counts herself lucky. Many Lebanese long to work hard, play harder, but the Syrian crisis has shaken an already volatile economy. Nearly all my friends have left because there's no work here. Each time I have to make a new group of friends. Hardly anyone can find a job in Lebanon. In summer, like many better off Lebanese, Yasmin goes to a beach club once a week to forget life's troubles. She's here in Jie, a resort south of the capital, with her friends and her mother Ada. Ada says joie de vivre in the face of adversity was always a Lebanese speciality. There's a love of life here because death is always around us. When death is a daily presence, life becomes more present to balance it out. There's little chance of forgetting the past even temporarily here in Shatila, a Palestinian refugee camp. Poverty reigns, aggravated by a new influx of Syrian refugees. The Sabra and Shatila massacre of 1982, one of the war's worst, is commemorated on its anniversary every September. Mohammed Surawad was 20 when an Israeli-backed Christian militia slaughtered between 800 and 3,600 Palestinians and Lebanese. Mohammed fled with other men of fighting age. No one thought women, children and the elderly would be their target. These are the bullet marks here and here. You can see them on the photograph. Here in the family home, Mohammed describes how his father, three young brothers and baby sister were killed. His son Abbas knows every detail. This is my grandfather and these are Aunt Shadia, Uncle Farid, Uncle Shadi and Uncle Nidal. If you saw those who killed your grandfather, your aunts and uncles, our relatives, what would you do? I would kill them like they killed our family. Mohammed believes he has a duty to make sure the 12-year-old never forgets. It's so that he knows how to defend himself, how to prevent this happening again, so that he's wary and strong and knows how to confront such matters. That's what I teach him. I'm not teaching him to love killing, not at all. For most of the war, Mohammed was a fighter with Yasser Arafat's Fatah movement. He was wanted by the Israeli army for years. Of course, I wanted revenge against the killers and the criminals who carried out the massacre, especially the Zionist enemy. 
We formed armed groups and would attack them in their bases and on patrol. A lasting legacy of the civil war is that it drove Beirutis into separate communities where sectarian leaders still hold sway, dead or alive. Bashir Jamail, assassinated in 1982, still watches over mainly Christian Ashrafiyi. 25-year-old Rasha lives in mainly Shiite Sheyah in the southern suburbs, a bastion for Hezbollah. Her father Rashid is the local official for the Amal party, one of Hezbollah's allies. We're just waiting for the electricity to come on. Has it cut? It's off. They give us two hours in the day, two at night. Power outs and water shortages are the stuff of daily conversation in Beirut. Generators and water trucks are part of the scenery. In the gap left by a weak state with crumbling infrastructure, people rely on themselves or parties such as Amal, which still control territories in the city. There are lots of places like this around here, where either Amal or Hezbollah guys sit and smoke shisha pipes and try to solve any local problems. If there's an incident, we intervene, we bring the guys together and try to reconcile them. Rashid fought for Amal during the civil war, yet Russia, born two years before it ended, grew up knowing little of his past. I could see people were still afraid of my father and in awe of him, and that people came to him for help. But I really didn't understand that he had been a fighter. Russia says her lack of curiosity is typical of her generation. Things changed when, by chance, she got a job at this non-profit organization called Oman. It turned out she was helping to create the largest archive on the Lebanese civil war. This is our website, Memory at Work. It has lots of different sections. The online archive includes documents on missing people and assassinations and a map of reported mass graves, reported because only two have been officially acknowledged. Russia got to work in the archives room where she sifted through the more than 20,000 newspaper articles that are now online. Soon she was reading everything about the war that she could lay her hands on. I found it all a bit silly at first, then I realised we were doing something very important, because we don't have a collective memory in Lebanon or a common history book. We don't know anything. And the more Russia learned, the more she found parallels between past and present. One day she was reading a newspaper report from 1985 about a bomb attack in nearby Bir al Abid when history repeated itself. The explosion went off exactly as I was reading it, which was really frightening. I dropped the newspaper and I ran to the place of the explosion. I hardly knew what I was doing. I believe this happened to me so that I could go and see how the events I'm reading about happen on the ground. Mariam Saidi relives history every day. In 1982, her eldest son Mahir disappeared, aged 15. She has painted and sculpted ever since to try to make sense of her loss. People said to me, don't always paint him. Why don't you paint something else? But they don't know that no painting or sculpture can end Mahir's story. Mahir's story will go on for as long as I am alive. Here in central Beirut, Mariam joins other relatives of the disappeared for a demonstration. But police prevent the marchers from descending towards the Prime Minister's palace. Up to 17,000 people went missing during the war. The protesters want the state to release an official investigation on the missing that was carried out in 2000 but kept under wraps. Even if it leads to bloodshed, we're going in. Our fight is not with you. We're on the same side, Mariam tells the police. About 30 members of the security forces are also missing held hostage by Islamist militants. People were kidnapped in the war, and people are being kidnapped now. What's happening is the same. The same warlords have run the state since 1975, and this is their legacy. After a 30-year search, Mariam learned something of Maher's fate. This is the Lebanese University Science Faculty, the scene of Maher's last battle. In 1982, the 15-year-old joined the Communist Party militia. They came here thinking they could prevent the Israelis entering Beirut. They only had light weapons. 
السلاح البسيط اللي معه مريم planted this tree on campus in Maher's memory after a Lebanese ex-militiaman contacted her he fought here too for the other side we took no prisoners he said if your son didn't get away he's dead Mariam says she desires no revenge. Civil war deceives and harms everyone. He could just as easily have been the one killed and my son the one who came home. I once saw the man from a distance and that was enough. I thought, God decided he would return to his mother and Mahir would not return to me. What can I do? The ex-fighter gave Mariam enough details for her to sketch out the story of her son's death. These bullet holes here are where they say some of the young men were executed. A few meters further down, Mariam stops at a small plot of land. This is where they told me there is a mass grave. It's his last resting place, and of course, it means a lot to me. Mariam is waiting for the state to investigate such sites so that she can formally identify Mahir and say goodbye. Like much of Lebanon's past, the civil war missing are buried in obscurity for fear the ghosts of yesteryear could disturb the fragile peace of today. Salim El Nadeb and Lucy Fielder revisiting Beirut then. Well, that's all from this edition of Revisited. You can watch it and all the other programmes, of course, on our website. That's France24.com. Thanks for watching.